Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It is my great pleasure to welcome best-selling author Richard Bach. He is the author of at least 11 books, starting with Jonathan Livingston Siegel, A Gift of Wings, The Bridge Across Forever, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, There's No Such Place as Far Away, One, Running from Safety, An Adventure of the Spirit, and in 2009, Hypnotizing Maria, he has a series of books called The Ferret Chronicles and Flying the Aviation Trilogy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome a legend in his own right, Richard Bach, to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Wow, <laughs> what an introduction, Kim. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> the first question I wanted to ask you was, you know how creative people, particularly, let's say, in music, may come out with an original bestseller for a song. And sometimes that bestseller is kind of like being cast in a television show as the main character, and then everybody knows you as that character, rather than for who you are in your full body of work. When Jonathan Livingston Siegel was released, was it hard for the public to receive your next book and your next book and your next book from your point of view? Um, no, um, because I, I don't know really what the public is. Uh, there was a lot of attention, a lot of publicity surrounding Seagull, uh, a year or so after it was published. Uh, and that was a pressure to think, uh, oh, what's my next book going to be? And, and when I realized that, I said, I, I'm not, I don't want to play this game at all. I don't have to write any other books if I don't want to. And the uh, the next book was something that was I thought was uh, much different, and I didn't know whether people were going to much care for it or not. And the same is true today. Uh, I've written a number of books that have been on the bestseller list. I've written a number of books that nobody's ever heard of, except thanks to you this morning. You mentioned the Ferret Chronicles, a series of five wonderful books about. Um, what 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 could our lives be like if we gave up the idea of evil? But nobody <laughs> has read those books. Well, um, I have, and a close friend has. <laughs> <laughs> so so it go, whether a book is successful is determined as you type the last page. If the entire set of ideas come running and hug each other on the last sentence, and everything that's gone before suddenly makes sense. That's a successful book. Now, whether it ever gets published or not is a completely different story, and that's up to somebody else. That's up to a publisher to decide. It's up to readers to decide if it's going to be well-read or or not, if it's going to last for 40 years or disappear. I was speaking with Gavin Menzies, who wrote the book 1421, and one of the things he shared is that when 1421 first came out, it didn't do that great, but five or six years later, it took off. Uh-huh. And it almost goes to show you that books have a life of their own, their creative works have a life of their own, and also the public readiness sometimes has a life of its own. Exactly right. Uh, timing is really important, but the, the writer doesn't have anything to do with the timing. The idea will present itself to the writer and say, here I am, are you interested? And sure enough, if that... Uh, suggestion takes fire, then the book is written. And timing, that's up to, again, that's up to someone else to decide. We can only do our best as, as writers to, to clearly sing whatever idea it is that that inner voice has given to us. Uh, after that, our job's done, and it's up to other forces in the universe to either say, uh, uh, well, that was very nice, but no one happens to be interested in your idea, or uh, you have a worldwide bestseller. When Jonathan first came out, didn't you get some profound rejections? <laughs> You're so sweet. You put it so gently. Yes. Oh, yes. Before before Jonathan was sold, I've got um, I got eighteen uh, reje- I got eighteen rejection slips. My agent got a mercifully. He didn't tell me how many more. But one of I got was a standard rejection slip. But the editor wrote at the bottom, oh, dear, no. And she underlined the dear with an exclamation point. And 
<laughs> that, that's the kind of thing where it, it really teaches you perspective. That's one person's opinion. Sorry to interrupt you, but isn't it amazing how in the author context, you can get caught in a web when your book is being sent out by your agent that it's going to be as good as the consciousness of the people in imagination who are reading it. Exactly right. That's a, that's a wonderful point. Uh, it's just as if, it's the same thing as a review. When you read a review of a book, it's really not about the book. A review is about the reviewer and the reviewer's experience with those ideas that the book represents. If they have been negative, it will be a negative review. And, and then the next reviewer may say, this is the best book I've ever read. And the same thing is true as the poor book goes out to publishers. It depends on who it is that reads the book when it comes in, reads the manuscript when it comes in. I haven't read all of your books, but I will tell you that Jonathan should be in all schools, should be read by all teachers, should be read by all families, and should be given to all children. Listen to that. That is so sweet. It's there true. There are other people who say that Jonathan should be burned and it's ashes stirred in acid. I'm stunned. <laughs> it just I still it. cry when I read that book. Oh, you I still hard. cry when I read that book. It is so profound. And really, it should be required reading for inspiration. Oh, no, it shouldn't be required because it, it'll set some people off. On the imagination level, when it comes to stretching, when it comes to vision, when it comes to dealing with peer pressure, I think it's a beautiful piece. It has a lot to say for certain readers and other readers, and uh, you, can, you can read the reviews on Amazon and, and other places. Other readers say, I don't see what anybody sees in this book. And, uh, and that's all right. Yeah. A book is written for a certain family of readers who share certain values. Um, I don't think a book's been written that has, has met the expectations of every single reader. So you get used to that as a writer. You don't say, I'm writing this book for the world. You say, I'm writing this book as an offer to my family, wherever they are out there in the world, and uh, I hope they find it. That's a great perspective. Well, it takes a lot of stress off as a writer, that, that's for sure. Uh, you, you know that uh, the destiny of your book is really not in your... It's in your hands so, so long as you are writing it down. After that, when you've made it as good as you can possibly make it as a writer, when you, as you said, there, there's a part in Jonathan where I still cry when I read that part. And when I was doing a, uh, uh, a voice uh, re recording of the thing, I had to go over it about five times before I could read it through without my voice breaking at that particular part. Um, because that, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those families of readers who really loves that book. Uh, and it's okay for others not to like it. I, I have a gift to give to a certain number of people, and they'll find the book no matter what. Were you concerned when you began formally writing, and I think you had one of the quotes that a professional writer is an amateur that has, what it, is it? That didn't quit. It yeah. didn't quit. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is so true. You, you look, at the, look at the biography of, of almost any writer, uh, who became commercially successful, and with very rare exceptions, it's a path of, of you go through this rejection. It's like being an actor. You have to be willing to say, this person rejected me and everything that I stand for, but maybe the next person won't. I think an exception is Truman Capote. I think Truman said he had never gotten a rejection slip. Um, but uh, what, uh, he's an absolutely wonderful writer. Uh, most of us have to learn our craft, and we do it. We find quality through quantity, uh, which startled me as a, as a young writer when I heard Ray Bradbury give a talk, and he said, the only way you're going to find quality in your writing is by writing a lot. You do, not, you do not dip your quill in purple ink and write one word a day. He said, write a thousand words a day, every day for the rest of your life. And I guarantee that in your first year, if you write a, every week, you write a 7,000-word short story. Your first year, you won't sell any of them. And your second year, you'll sell one, and maybe three will be pretty good. And your third year, you'll sell 15, and so forth. And he, he said, this is what it's going to be. And the only way you can do it is by writing a lot, and then you'll see yourself emerge as a writer. And I didn't think that was true because Bradbury was special. He was a great writer and all that kind of stuff. And I went back and I read uh, his very first story published. And he 
here's this wonderful byline, Ray Bradbury, and I'm getting ready for this wonderful story. And it was awful. It was just terrible. <laughs> and, and, and I was delighted because what that told me was what Ray had said was absolutely true. You start out with this, you've got all kinds of twigs and, and leaves and the old trash sitting on this wonderful crystal deep well of who we really are. And it takes a while to clear all that junk off just by writing. And then suddenly a sentence will come through and you say, did I write that? That's not bad at all. And you keep writing. After a while, those sentences become more and more. You see them popping up all over the place. And finally, you stand back and you, and you look at a book that you've just finished and you say, I don't know who wrote this book, <laughs> but yeah. it, was, it was something. It was handed to me. And you see just many, many, many writers feel the same way that they really didn't uh, invent. They didn't create these characters. The characters kind of came to them. Uh, and they came to them with a, with a re- remarkable idea uh, for them, uh, for illusions, for instance. Um, I'd been barnstorming, flying an old biplane around the country and hopping passengers for $3 a ride out of hayfields. <laughs> and about a year after doing that, uh, I said, gee, that's awfully lonely life. What would it be like to have somebody to talk to? And then suddenly they said, well, what, what would it be like if in the fields you met and you became the best friend to the savior of the world who's quit his job? He doesn't like everybody uh, clawing at him and he quits his job. What would it be like? What kind of things would he think he could do these miracles? Well, are they really miracles? Would he teach you? Would you want to learn? All those questions followed me around, and I, would, I just finally became um, at the center of this wonderful whirlpool of light, and all of a sudden this character appeared. And he said, uh, here I am. Uh, you can start writing now. And sure enough, uh, I am. some writers are very, very organized, and they'll have... Uh, computer files about backstories and all that. Kind of, I'm exactly the opposite. I have no clue when I start page one, chapter one, where this book is going. All I know is something's happening. The, the typewriter used to be a typewriter. The computer now just disappears in front of me, and I'm I'm kind of looking into this tunnel of mist, and and uh, there's a little stage, and suddenly here these characters come, and I don't invent their dialogue. I just listen to what they say. And I type it down. My typing skills are the most important thing I bring to my writing. And, uh, and I'm as amazed as, as I hope a, a reader is at sudden turns or, or unexpected twists in, in a story. I'm sure that you've sat down to write or listened for the writing, transmitted it to the page, and then gotten to a point where you don't know what else to say or nothing else is happening at the moment, do you stop, turn off your computer, and revisit it? It or doesn't. Do you... It just keeps going. And, and um, again, this is a function of writing a lot every day. You can, uh, you can pick a time, and usually it's a, the time when the inner you really doesn't want to stop. When, when the story is really tumbling along, it's, you're typing as fast as you can type, and then you say, I'm, I'm going to fall over now. I'm just exhausted. I'm going to stop at this point where a lot is going on, and I'll pick it up tomorrow. And sure, if you come back in tomorrow, you read the last page that you've done, and wham, it's all there again. And you, you just go on, or I don't say you, I'll say I just, that's my way. I just pick up from that point and go on. There is never a point, and these days at least, it used to be, but it's never, never a point of, well, where do I go now? I've got a thing on my computer screen that says, have fun, don't think, and don't care. I love that. And that's really important not to care. Because if you start caring, what's a reader going to think? What's a publisher going to think? Then you, then you just, you're, you're like a uh, caterpillar that starts to think, well, let's, how do I walk? Which leg do I put forward now? And it winds up in a little churning ball of legs there, confused. Um, but if you just say, I'm going with this story. Uh, I, I love it. I love the characters. I love what's happening. I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'll find out as I keep typing. <laughs> and that's the way it is for me and, and for a number of other writers and others have different ways and they all work for them. It reminds me a bit of a kind of cosmic download and then the writer 
their job is to stay receptive. That is a fascinating term, a cosmic download, and it uh, and and it's really true. Um, it is just once this idea touches you, and it comes from where I don't know, but uh, you could be in the grocery store buying potato chips, and wham, here is this thing that that just stops you cold in the aisle, and you say, "My goodness, that would that is fascinating." And then you kind of wander down the aisle and you run into a, you know, a stack of tomato juice cans or something, and then you say, I, I had better start writing this stuff down. Did you ever worry about your ability to make money and sustain yourself with your love, your passion? Oh, sure. The whole first years of my career was, uh, uh, I guess I have to say, a cliche for writers. Uh, I found out early on after I left the Air Force that I, I couldn't hold a job. I could last about nine months at a job. I'd go crazy with boredom, and I'd quit. And I'd say, well, I remember what Ray Bradbury said, I'm going to try to be a writer, so I'd write some. And every time I stepped onto that raft of writing, it would sink. Uh, and I'd maybe sell a story or two or an article or two, uh, but then I'd have to go back and find some other job um, carrying the mail or delivering telephone books or as a draftsman in a boat building company for nine months and so forth. And then I'd go, then I'd go back to writing. Every time the raft would sink, uh, but each time it sank a little bit more slowly until finally it reached the point, and it's, it's always, we, we create our own dramas in our lifetime, and so I reached a point where the car was being repossessed and all that kind of stuff, and I was going to have to go back to work. I was going to be a flight instructor again, and then... <laughs> Strange thing happened where the the much rejected seagull story suddenly sold, and then then my life changed. I said, okay, so you've handled poverty and belief in yourself as a writer. Now, now we'll give you a, a bigger test. How do you handle a whole lot of money when you don't know a thing about money? And of course, my cliche continued. I was smashed flat and went bankrupt after a while. <laughs> Had to rebuild. I'm not laughing at you. I'm just like. <laughs> it's just a wild ride, isn't it? It, it is a wild ride. <laughs> and, and lots and lots of uh, writers or, or uh, people who make their living uh, uh, creatively in the arts, uh, it, it, the same thing happens. If you're a songwriter, if you're an actor, if you're a, a dancer, if you're Mikhail Baryshnikov, and all of a sudden the world discovers you, you're going to go through a really difficult time. You have the attention of thousands of people on you and uh, as soon as you're perceived as somebody who's made a whole lot of money you become a magnet and all these people come toward you and say here I know how to spend your money invest here invest there give it to me and you're just like a like some little child with saucer eyes oh really oh well, that'll be fine and it just happens over and over again Barry Manilow went through a very similar thing and, and there's probably a whole lot of a whole lot of people that are very well known who haven't shared that with us, but it's a very common path. It happens to a lot of people in music entertainment as well. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I listened to several of your interviews on YouTube in video and also read some of them. And you talked about kind of your excitement and wonder about books changing lives. And I wondered if you could speak a little about that. I've seen it happen in my life. A certain book um, I am, now as we're moving into this new house, I'm putting the books that have been in storage for a long time, and I see these old friends coming back to, oh, that, I remember how that touched me and changed me and moved me. And I get, occasionally I'll get a letter from someone who will say, one of your books has done that for me. And I had uh, one remarkable one happened years ago. I got a letter from somebody in New York who said, thank you very much for writing Illusions and and uh, it touched me in a strange way. I was drunk. I was lying on the sidewalk in Manhattan, and I was freezing to death. And not far away from me, on the ground, was a copy of your book, paperback copy of your book, Illusions. The cover was torn off and been thrown away. And it just, it, I, I reached for it, and it opened at a certain point. And what I read radically changed my life. This is my choice. I have made all the decisions that led me here, and I have the power to make the decisions that will lead me away. And he had, and that had happened years before, and and he 
sudden, somehow, somehow got a, a grip on his life and become a successful business person and finally decided to write me that story. And that it was so touching. Uh, and, and because I knew um, similar things have, have happened uh, to me, I've been at very difficult times in my life. And then I read a book and I get to the point where I can open a book at random and wham, there's something that's very important for me. Uh, after Seagull came out, people were a number of people told me, uh, you know, here's you should really be reading this book. It's called Seth Speaks by Jane Roberts. I said, yeah, yeah. Then another person would say, uh, have you, ever, you ever heard of a book called Seth Speaks? And I said, oh, well, yeah, somebody recommended it. Yeah, yeah. Then it was in New York in a, this huge secondhand bookstore, and as I'm walking down the aisle, uh, way up on a shelf over my head, there was a book that was about ready to fall. Somebody had put it back in, but it was still like three inches coming out over the... I was going to fall on somebody, so I reached up to put it back in, and it was Seth Speaks. It was that book. Wow. Hey! And I opened the book. I, my test for any book is I open it at random three times, and if it catches me every time, intensely, three times, bam, 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 I buy the book. Sounds like the I Ching. <laughs> yes, very much like the I Ching, yes. <laughs> And that that was a wonderful book and started a whole uh, conversation with uh, Jane Roberts, the author, and her husband, Rob Butts, and uh, a good friendship and a wonderful experience with this strange character called Seth. Um, so I, I think um, uh, books, if we want them to be, books are, are guideposts in our life. And they can say, they tell us, here's what another human being did in this situation. Here's what someone else thinks and feels. It doesn't matter if they're fiction or nonfiction. How does it apply to my life? And certain books can say, this absolutely applies to your life. Listen up. And I think many of us have that same thing. That something really touches us and says, that's me. That, that writer is writing about me. He's writing about my past and my future. What could be my future? And that, uh, that's magical stuff. I love to be involved in, in, in a kind of business uh, that involves exchange of ideas that can change people's lives, mine included. In the big change in the publishing industry, the fact that we can create books on demand has changed the landscape of actualizing a book yes. for many writers that may have been rejected by many publishers and yep. may be fed up and want to dress their book package it in a certain way, a certain look, want to name it and put it out there and then let it fly. What do you think of that? I think it's wonderful. It opens the door, as you said, for many, many writers uh, who can now say, I'll make the book exactly the way I want it to be. And then I will see if I can um, put it on the web or something like that. But a lot of books now come through publishers after having been published first on their own. And, and then a publisher gets this thing, and, and the, the writer says, I've sold 3,000 copies of this on, uh, on the web. Uh, don't you think you might be interested in this? And the publisher says, absolutely. So a number of books have come that way, and some have been bestsellers too. Yeah, I, I think that, that, that opens the door a little bit wider. It, it used to be that you just, had to just slog through these difficult, difficult times. And, and now you can, you can see that book published. I used to imagine, when I was writing a book, I would imagine it finished, and there it is sitting on my shelf. And I would kind of hold this thought, and, and as I wrote, I, that, that became truer and truer. But now you can actually do that. And you can do covers and see it and imagine it. Do you usually see the name of your book, or do you find you get to that after it's all written? Afterwards, almost invariably afterwards. Uh, it'll jump out in, in some sentence, in some cases, the last sentence in the book. Stranger to the Ground, for instance, my first book. I didn't know what the title of that was going to be. But there it was, suddenly, in the, in the very last page, and I think it was the last sentence or the second to last sentence. Uh, it was the last sentence. Wham! There was a the title of the book. So I just worry, I don't worry about titles anymore. They will come to me somehow. And um, That requires tremendous trust in oh, terms of your own name, being that, as an instrument, right? That is the experience of a writer. You must trust. 
You don't have to know in advance how everything's going to work out. You don't know how you have to know what the end of this sentence is going to be. Just keep writing. It will take care of itself. And the same thing for the uh, the sale of a book. And um, uh, I've, I've I've had the whole thing. I've had very very difficult times. There's a kind of fakery that that used to exist, and to some extent still does, in uh, in the publishing world. Uh, it used to be that if no one had heard your name, they they wouldn't read your your book, even though it might have been a beautiful book. You had to just fight, fight, fight to even get it read. And then that fakery turns around. If you've had a couple of bestsellers, then they'll print anything you write just because they know your name. And you have to be careful for that too. You know, make make sure that as a writer, you love the book. If you don't write it, do not offer it to anybody because if they accept it, it's going to be out there and you won't like it and your name will be on it. And that's not good. I have done that with magazine articles. I've worked for a magazine that I had to write some stories that I really didn't like. They were just very nuts and bolts, run-of-the-mill things. and I, I would use a pseudonym, a different name when, I, when that article was published. But even today, I'm the only one in the world who knows that I wrote these boring stories, <laughs> these boring <laughs> articles. They're out there, but fortunately, nobody else in the world knows it. You're funny. You're very funny. Have you always had a good sense of humor? Um, I think as a writer, you kind of have to. Uh, you sound like you deal with a lot of irony really well. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that happens. You do, you do need that. You do need the perspective of being able to see through the crisis of the moment. I'm starving here, universe. Uh, Help me. The universe said, oh, don't worry. The universe always says, don't worry, right? Because it has perspective. Our little guardian angels say, don't worry. You're going through a hard time. It's a test that you've brought to yourself to see if you're going to hang in there during these difficult times. You will. Everything will be okay. And you say, but hey, I've got... I got one box of Kraft dinner on the shelf. It says, "Don't worry, some uh, you'll be taken care of." And sure enough, some amazing thing happens. By coincidence, we are led through these lives, and somehow we manage to survive. You talk about the relationship between editors and writers. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. I think that's so important. How they're led to each other. You talk about an idea being a magnet. Sure. And this magnet brings the writer and the editors together. Talk a bit about that. You say it very eloquently. Um, it is um, the idea needs a circle of people in order to express itself. The center of the circle is the writer, of course. There's uh, there's this wonderful idea, and then you know, if the writer fulfills her job or his job, then that that book is written, and it's a lovely book successful book, lovely book. Now, how does it get out in the world? The next step is somehow it has to find an editor. And it'll go through, at least for me, go through a number of people before finally someone says, I love this book. I love this book. And they will stand up in an editorial meeting at um, Macmillan or Harper or Simon & Schuster or whatever and say, look, I really don't care what you guys think. I'm I'm going to pub. I love this book, and I'm going to publish it. And that's in fact exactly what happened with Seagull. Because Seagull had already been rejected at Macmillan by a different editor. When Eleanor Frieda found the manuscript, and she said, "I love this book." This is that the talking Seagull, Eleanor she said, "Yes, it's a talking Seagull, <laughs> and I'm going to publish it now. Leave me alone." And it needed that voice, that editor's voice, to to stand up for it. And sure enough, they left her alone. They said, well, okay, keep it cheap, Eleanor. It's going to fail. It's not going to fail. Isn't that amazing how somebody can become a champion of yes. somebody's work, and because they are championing it, they're bringing it through, and they almost have a kind of spiritual accountability that that book, that contribution should be out in the public. Wonderful. That- Boy, that is so well said, a spiritual accountability. And Eleanor Frieda made, she wrote, to me, she said, Richard, I think this book, your little seagull book, I think that's going to that's going to speak for decades. She really believed in it. Is she alive? Oh, she isn't. She died um, 
five or ten years ago. Wow, it would have been wonderful to thank her, whatever. I think in the write-up about you, I would like to put a special tribute and thank you to her. Please. And, and I actually think she was so visionary about Jonathan, but Jonathan is timeless. It will never end. It will never go away. Well, those are sweet words, and, and she said essentially the same thing. She really believed in it. She fought hard for it. And then that circle goes out, and from there, the book needs a designer. And sure enough, then the, this, this wonderful designer, Joan Stoliar, also now dead, but brilliant designer, she designed the book so that there was never um, a, a sentence always ended before you turned the page and photographs and all that kind of stuff. You have a lot of beautiful packaging and design on your books. It's almost like you've had the magic wand on everything. When your last designer passed away, you found other designers for your books because they have uh, this they, magical tone to them. They were there, and they, um, the, after a certain point, the, the publisher will say, hey, if you want to have a hand in the design of this book, please do. And I always have. It's always been important to me what it looks like, what the uh, cover looks like, because that, that can say a lot. So I've uh, pretty well been involved in most of the um, uh, designs. I had a feeling that you were, and I just can't imagine authors completely turning over the clothing of their creative work, how they're dressed. Well, uh, sometimes, um, uh, unless you've um, got a fair amount of clout, the publisher will say, well, may not even ask you. They'll just say, hey, hey, the art department is going to do it. Um, don't bother us. And it depends on the author. The author can say, I'm not going to accept that. Uh, it's important to me the way this book were, uh, looks. And uh, if you don't want me to have a hand in the design, well, then uh, don't publish the book. I'll take it elsewhere. Uh, the nice thing is today that authors can do that. Sure, it is. And I would imagine, you know, you're encapsulating this creative work and that design is going to attract or repel people. That is so true, right. There are, there are lovely books written that have just awful windows to the world. That front jacket can, can Terrible. just do a lot. Uh, I see it all the time. <laughs> yeah. I'm in bookstores a lot. I see it all the time. I interview a lot of authors and creative people, and I wonder what happened at the publishing end there. What happened? Well, it, it happens that uh, a book will come along and the art department or designer will not particularly be interested in the subject, and, uh, but yet they're hired to do it, so they'll whip something out, which they consider to be, well, all right, this ought to do it, and then move on. I've got five more books to design here. And so it doesn't get the intensity of the love and caring uh, that an author or that someone who is really crazy about the book would do. I think book packaging is an art and a science. Yes, it is. Yeah, and, and there's a huge amount of creativity. Joan Stoliar, when she did uh, The Bridge Across Forever, she had a, had a ring made. As a ring was important in the book. And she suspended it by, by one of her hairs. She, uh, she had long hair. She <laughs> plucked one of her hairs out. She tied it. She suspended it. She photographed it against the background. Oh, she just worked like crazy on that. And that's the kind of thing that makes for a really, really beautiful cover. That's awesome. I first heard about you again last year when I interviewed Paul Smith. And we were talking about remote viewing. We did a whole piece on it. Oh, yeah. And it just came out in the interview that you were very interested in remote viewing and had funded some of the development at SRI. And I said, what? <laughs> I love him. <laughs> oh, my God. My wow, favorite book a, ever. Not many people know that. That was a long time ago. Sure, I'm, I was fascinated, still am. Me too. Fascinated with that. And, uh, and that was working with Russell Targ and Hal Putoff back there at SRI. And I said, how is it that, how is it that people can know what's going on in a place where, where they're not? And they said, well, come out and, and be a subject. I said, well, I'm not psychic. They said, we don't care. Come on out here and we'll show you. And I was so curious that I did it. I went out there and they put me in this closed room <laughs> and Russell reached over and closed the Venetian blind so I couldn't even see out. And then, uh, then Hal put off, got in this little Volkswagen, Volkswagen and he had a, this whole sheath, a, whole, a box of potential uh, destinations with something visual and interesting, Adam. 
and he had a, ra- a random number generator. Went out to his car, hit the random number generator, stopped it at random, whatever that number was. He picked the number of that file, and he drove to that place somewhere within 15 minutes. And meanwhile, I'm back there in this room with Russell talking about the weather and getting awfully nervous. And uh, then Russell looks at his watch and says, okay. Uh, he turns on the tape recorder. He says, subject is Richard Bach. Here's the date. Here's the time. And uh, he said, uh, uh, Richard, tell me uh, where Hal is. <laughs> and I felt the shock of cold go through me. I say, um, am I, are my eyes supposed to be open or, or closed, Russell? He said, doesn't make any difference. Just give me your impressions. I closed my eyes. And it was remarkable. All of a sudden, I saw, I had a, just an impression. And I said, I'm making this up. And he said, that's okay, make it up. Just make it up. And I said, Hal, is, um, is that a miniature golf course? There's this place with a real steep roof. <laughs> and, uh, and it's in a park. And he's, he's walking inside. And there's a, there's a counter in front of him and a map behind the counter and uh, there's a oh it's a car rental place it must be a car rental place because there's this big logo it's Hertz or something it, it's, it's a big fleur-de-lis there and Russell says uh-huh uh-huh because that's all he says while you're doing it uh-huh <laughs> and then he said uh, look up see if uh, what's over Hal Where? and I looked up and I said Oh, there's colored lights in the ceiling, but they're not electric lights. Russell said, okay, they're not electric lights. Anything else? And then a few other little things. With that company logo stood out. And they said, it has to be a car rental place with a real steep roof and something and the colored lights in the ceiling. So they said, okay, and that's the end of it. And it, I've talked for, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that. And then... We waited for Hal to come back, and I was just a bundle of nerves. Am I crazy? But some of this stuff came very clear. Hal came back, and he showed me. First, he showed me a picture. He said, no, no, I don't want to show you the picture. Let's go there. So we all piled in his Volkswagen, and we went there. And it wasn't a miniature golf place at all. It was a, it was a church, but it was, had this, it was a radical modern church. It had a very, very steep roof. It was like a huge miniature golf place. We walked in. The place was empty, empty but as it being a weekday, uh, and the counter, it wasn't a counter. There was a kind of a railing and an altar. And it wasn't a map behind there. It was a, a filigree of vertical lines and horizontal lines and circles. And the company logo was a huge golden cross. And I looked up. And there were colored lights. There were green and blue, stained glass, no electricity. Wow. It just felt just this chill go through me. I said, uh, Russell, uh, what if I, I don't understand what's going on. He said, we don't understand either. We're trying to find out. I said, well, what if I couldn't do it? He said, you would be fascinated because we haven't found anyone who can't do it. Wow. How did that translate to you? Because did you think it was just being psychic? Didn't you have to draw images too? It, it, uh, it translated to me in that we all have capacities that we, can't, we can barely imagine. And it's only when we try them out that we find out we can do this strange stuff that seems to be impossible. Um, SRI, Russell and Hal from then, went on, they had contracts with the government. In fact, I think there's a movie out right now that's called uh, Men Who Stare at Goats or something like that. I haven't seen it, but uh, it's about exactly this thing. Uh, So we have those capacities. Those are gradually becoming recognized, and it takes the courage to experiment with it. I was really scared because I thought, you know, I'm just going to come up with nothing here. And they have found that some people are better than other people. Some people naturally have gifts. Some people can play the piano and some people can sing. And the rest of us can learn if we want to. Um, we may not be as gifted as others, but, but we all have, the, to some extent, have that capacity if we practice it. 
And it's sometimes a little scary when we see that this stuff works. Wow. Do you ever have an opportunity to talk with young writers or people that are just starting out? Or do you give classes or seminars or anything online? No. Gotcha. Uh, Once in a while, I will meet a young writer um, and have the chance to talk a little bit if they're interested. Um, That... That meeting with Ray Bradbury, when I've, I've heard him give a talk, and that really impressed me. And then later, when I finished my first book and set it out for its first rejection, um, I wrote a letter to Ray, and I said, you don't know me, but I was at that talk you gave in Long Beach, California. You really impressed me. Uh, you convinced me that I could do this, and I've just sent out the first manuscript of my first book, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but thank you, Ray Bradbury. And he wrote back two pages, hand-typed, single-spaced, uh, thanking me. He said, uh, you will never be able to repay your gift to me, and I can never repay my gift to uh, Frederick Pohl or whoever it was who had helped him. The only way you can do that is to pass it along. The only way I can repay my gift to the man who helped me so much, is to help you. And it goes on. You pass the torch, Richard. You pass the torch. So from time to time that has happened. Um, I used to give talks. Uh, I do very rarely now. But I'll talk about writing or um, I'll be talking about airplanes that are flying. I'm coming up here before too long. And I like to do that once in a while. But uh, no, I, I don't have any kind of... Uh, program. It, it's, I think it's kind of for every writer. The best thing you could say to a young writer is don't write. Don't even try it. It's too hard. And then if they do it anyway, then they're, then they're destined to be a writer because you have to go through this difficult thing. You don't have to. But most of us seem to go through difficult times on the road. Let's talk a little bit about Hypnotizing Maria, your book that was released in 2009. That's the most recent book, correct? Well, yeah, that's the most recent book, and it was, um, like all the books, startling. It came, how do I say? I spent most of my life uh, flying airplanes. That's my one of my great loves. And I flew in the Air Force, and I flew in little airplanes and all that kind of thing. And I was a flight instructor. One of the, one of the jobs that I held uh, was a flight instructor. And it wasn't until decades later, until just a few years ago, that I realized, as a flight instructor... I almost never touched the controls of the airplane. I sat there next to the student, my arms folded, saying, now you might try to just lift the nose a little bit higher here and watch what happens. See the airspeed slowing down as you lift the nose? Hold it there. Yeah, hold it there. Now the airplane's going to start to shudder, and we call that a stall. And sure enough, the airplane starts to shudder. And, and I never touched the controls. Wow. And then I'm suddenly from this... Uh, memory uh, suddenly made sense to me. And I realized what I was doing was I was offering suggestions. And isn't that so much of what happens in all of our lives? Aren't we creatures of suggestion? We accept them or we, uh, we deny them. We take, take one day and count how many suggestions, if you can count that high, that come to us from other people, from newspapers, from billboards, from television, from the uh, Internet, all these suggestions saying the world is no good or the world is terrific or here's what you should do or here's what you shouldn't do. Uh, All these things come to us, and we're the ones who decide. We have the final choice. Suggestions come from ourselves. I mustn't do that. That's too dangerous. Or I want to do that. It'll give me a thrill, whatever. I realize that we are all hypnotized. The definition of hypnotism is suggestion accepted. Wow. And that suddenly clicked. And here was this, all of a sudden, this story just, bam, was there. And the opening chapter of the book is uh, my, my character who is a lot like me. He's a flight instructor and he's flying across the country, and he hears this woman's voice on the radio saying, help me, help me, my husband, I think my husband's died. 
and he happens to, the voice is pretty loud and clear, so she's fairly close, and he he comes on the air, he talks with her a little bit, and finds out where she is. She says, I can't fly, I can't fly. And he finds her in, in the air, and he sees it. All he does is, is, did what I did for a long time, he just gave her suggestions, say, hey, you're flying fine. You just, just kind of keep those wings level, and you'll be fine, I'll find you in a minute. And sure enough, he does. He joins up on her wing in formation. He just talks to her really calm and is, he cracks some terrible jokes and all that kind of thing. And uh, he convinces her as, as they fly along. He said, he said, let's just kind of tilt that little, the, the wheel in front of you, just tilt it to the right a little bit. There you go. And she swings into this bank. And he's right flying alongside her. He said, okay, now just the other way. Just turn it the other way. <laughs> <laughs> nice and easy. You're doing great. You're you're doing great. What's your name? And she says, I'm, I don't know how to fly. And he says, you're doing, you've been flying. You're doing fine. I'm right here. I'm an instructor, voice of authority, right? I'm an instructor. Don't worry. And sure enough, he flies her over to Cheyenne and makes a big wide pattern. And he just stays right on her wings. Pull the power back a little bit now. Now you want to ease the nose up. You're doing great. You're right on the center line right together, two airplanes coming down. And she says, your wheels are going to touch in about five seconds. Everything's going to be fine. Then just pull that little that little black handle, pull that little throttle back. Sure enough, squeak, squeak, her wheels touch. He's, meanwhile, he's called the tower, and the fire trucks come out, and the ambulance come out for her husband. And he said, no, all you have to do is just, just pull that thing out and step on the little brakes on the, on the top of the rudder pedals, and they're right behind you. They'll be with you right away. Then he just pushes the throttle forward. As she lands, he just goes on. He said, hey, I do this all the time. I'm a flight instructor. Uh, and then he realizes later on, he has some meetings with some strange characters and realizes that he did. He sees in the next next day at, at the airport where he lands, someone's taken a newspaper clipping and pinned it to the wall of this lady who was saved by this mystery person who appeared alongside she he hypnotized me she said she said he hypnotized me i can't fly an airplane but i did i landed it and he said how silly hypnotizing but then he realized of course that it does and then that applies to all other aspects of his life and he realizes that sees how he can change the events that are coming to him by crafting the suggestions that he accepts that's awesome it's a, it's it's kind of interesting, and it's one of those books where relatively few people have read it. I don't, I don't think it'll ever be a bestseller, but it's touched a few people, and I've gotten a letter or two, uh, which is rare. I don't get much mail at all, but a few people have written about uh, hypnotizing Maria and have enjoyed the book, and that's what it's all about. That's my, my job is to take the time that they wouldn't take to play with this particular idea and then present it to them. Say, is this interesting or not? And if it is, then my job is done. I often say right now to people to be very mindful what kind of suggestions they receive about what's happening on the Gulf Coast. How you have to be rigorous not to accept all these suggestions because it goes into automatic pilot. Sure. There, there are, there's just wonderful developments on, on that idea. Uh, and if you want to get... Uh, technical about it. There, there's a book written called The Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics by Hugh Everett III, published by the Princeton University Press, that says every second this universe splits into alternate uh, alternate universes. We decide which universe we go to by, uh, by what we accept for true. So right now, according to Hugh Everett and a, a whole lot of calculus that I can't follow, um, there are those of us who are saying the oil spill is going to be a disaster unprecedented, unprecedented, and then there's alternate worlds where they've capped this thing already. There are That's alternate correct. worlds where it never happened at all. And uh, we, can, we kind of pick our way through the universes by the suggestions that we choose to accept. Have you ever wanted to quit writing, ever? No. I've been really tired um, uh, right, I'm physically tired, um, but no, the ideas are always, it's like a, a sunrise, 
you ever get tired of, of watching a sunrise? Uh, no. Um, well, after a while, the sunrise becomes noon and it becomes a sunset. But tomorrow's another sunrise, and it's fascinating if you happen to be up and around at that time to see the light come up in the sky. I feel the same way about writing, that there are those ideas that suddenly come that are like sunrises, um, that, that are so fascinating, they are so nourishing to explore those ideas, at the same time to be writing them down, see what characters come along, if it's going to be a fiction story, what characters, or if it's going to be nonfiction, uh, to look back into your own life and say, oh, now I realize why this had to happen. Because if that hadn't happened, this wouldn't have happened. Our lives are matrix matrices yes. of coincidence. And it is any one of us can look back. You can say to a lot of people, how did you meet your mate? And with very few exceptions, it was a wild coincidence. I never should have met her at all. <laughs> no, but it just so happened that her friend happened to be walking by, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We ask ourselves those questions. The important times in my life, how did they happen? Very often we'll say, well, it just seems to be coincidence. Then we look farther and say, well, maybe it's not coincidence. Maybe there's an inner guidance that's going on. Maybe there are little guardian angels flapping around here and kind of helping us out in difficult times. Has the stress, not only the delight of writing, but the stress once the book is done, packaged and out there, the being in the world, needing to manifest the money in between books, ever affected or impacted your relationships, your most important relationships? Boy, that's a good question, Kim. Thank you. Uh, it comes from a rabbinic place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, takes, it takes a special uh, companion, a special mate, uh, who can say, uh, everything's going to work out. Because in writing, or in, again, in any of these same creative calling, you don't know. You don't know if this book is going to sell at all, let alone... Uh, uh, Sell enough to uh, allow you to survive, uh, but there's a there's a level of belief that's required, and over the years I've gotten to to trust that uh, that belief that um, I'm given these ideas for a reason. There are certain people out there in the world who can benefit from them. I trust that first I'll be able to write a story that's interesting enough to hold their attention. And second, that there'll be enough of them that they'll they'll buy enough books that I can go on flying my little airplane, right? And somehow that's just worked out. Uh, if I if I wanted to guarantee it to someone, I couldn't do it. I could just say, well, that word you used before, you just you trust. I'm doing the best I know how to be, the best writer I can be, the best human being I can be. And sometimes I fail at both of them terribly. But overall, I'm working in that direction. That's what I want. I want to write beautiful stories. I want to write stories that touch me first. If they touch me, I'm a fairly average person. They'll touch other people like me if they can find them. You sound like an old soul. Well, uh, you live on this kind of hope, right? And you create what may very well be a fiction. None of this may be true. But I do believe that, uh, that we're all of us led and guided and protected at certain times. And that seems to be true in my life. I accept that as true. And I assume that it's not suddenly going to quit. Your garden angels are suddenly going to say, uh, well, it was nice knowing you. Uh, we'll see you around. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Jonathan Livingston Siegel, where did that name come up? Did you come up with that name? How do you define you? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. That's, let's do another hour on how you define you. Can we do that? Let's suspend our need to deal with that question because I think that's an hour just chipping around at it. <laughs> well, I guess my question to you then, I'll restate. We'll pretend we're in a court of law. Sir, <laughs> did Jonathan come to you in the writing of that book or was yeah. Jonathan brought to you after it was completed? Jonathan was it was unlike 
in its intensity, it was unlike any book I've done. Um, I was a brand new beginning writer. I was stepping on that raft for one of the first times. And I was, as you were saying, worrying about how am I going to pay the rent? I was walking at night alone, and I heard a voice. Somebody behind me said, Jonathan Livingston Seagull. In just about that tone, I couldn't, it wasn't a male, it wasn't a female, it was, I just heard that. And it scared me, and I took, because I thought I was alone, I turned around, and there was nobody there behind me, <laughs> the right. I heard that, and I didn't, I'm not psychic, and yet here's this thing, strange thing. And uh, I went home and locked the door and said, what does that mean? And I had no clue, and I'm, I, sat down. It was late at night. I said, come on, voice. Did, did you mean to talk to somebody else to whom this means something? Uh, I, because honestly, I don't understand. And that, no reply, silence, utter silence. I said, that has got to be the weirdest thing that's ever happened to my, in my life. And then just when I was giving up about midnight, the wall disappeared and here was this movie screen and all of a sudden well it wasn't a movie screen it was like empty air i was i was flying up high and here's the the sea down below and here's this little seagull flying along and i said that's what a jonathan livingston seagull is and i knew like in a dream i just knew who he was i knew his heart i knew what he was striving for all this stuff instantly and I just started writing. And uh, that time I was writing by hand. Green ballpoint pen, I will never forget. <laughs> Wrote as fast as I could write about here it was morning and here's this little seagull flying along and he's way up high. And the flock is way down below him. Little tiny specks down below. But he's practicing flying. And that was fascinating to me because I'm obviously I'm a flyer and I love this stuff. And so that just... That just carried me, and I was just i am stunned by this strange vision. And then all of a sudden, about, oh, I don't know, two-thirds of the way through part one, where he does this crazy flying, he gets thrown out of the flock, uh, all of a sudden, woof, somebody tripped over the power cord to this movie, and the scene disappears, and I'm looking at a blank wall. And it's like something is saying, If you think you're inventing this, invent the rest, Richard. And I had no clue when I started thinking about it. Well, let's see, if I were a seagull and I've just been thrown out of the flock and I've done this crazy flying, what do I do? I fight them. I fight them. I fight back. No, come on. You don't fight back. Uh, What do I do? And I had no idea what I would do. And I finally put it away. Manuscripts unfinished. I remember that file. There were these pages and pages of green ballpoint pens. <laughs> and I finally, no, there was no answer. Eight years later. Eight <gasps> years. Eight years. Oh, my God. I was living in Iowa, 1,500 miles away from California. I woke up from a dream, 5 o'clock in the morning. great thing about being a writer is you can sleep as late as you want. 5 o'clock in the morning, wham, that's the ending to that story. I know, no, no, it's downstairs, that story. Yes, yes. Now I have an electric typewriter and I type as fast as I can type. And there's the end of part one and bam, there was part two, there's part three. That's awesome. Where did this come from? Why did it wait? I have no clue, right? But here's this story and sure enough, if it came in this strange way, it is going to just sell first time out. Fastest rejection I've ever had. Oh, thank you. It's not our cup of tea. Oh, dear, no. Not a talking seagull, Richard. (laughs) How does this happen? Why does this stuff come in this strange way and then it's rejected? Is this my life? And then coincidence, right? Then I I go out. They repossess the car. I go out and I'm standing in the driveway by my mailbox. I get two pieces of mail. One piece of mail is an envelope. I know what that means. It's the manuscript of Jonathan Seagull's come back from my agent. He can't sell it. I like your little story, Richard, but no one in Manhattan does. Time to move on. What's next? The other letter from Macmillan Publishing Company. Dear Richard Bach, I've read some of your writing. I wonder if it's 
is it possible that you would have a manuscript that's not committed to another publisher? I'd like to see it, Eleanor Frieda. Wow. Standing there in the driveway, I've got this manuscript in one hand, I've got this letter in the other hand, saying, do you have a manuscript? Not, is it ever not committed? Wham! Speed of light out to Eleanor. And she goes crazy for it. She says, I love your little seagull. She doesn't say, what? A talking seagull? This is crazy. I love your seagull. We're going to publish it. It won't pay you very much, but I, I don't care. I'll pay you to publish it, Eleanor. I've got to see what happens. To this book. <laughs> so there, and so there it happened. This whole string of, of unbelievable coincidences that if you wrote them down as fiction, no one would believe it. What were the chances of that happening? A zil- I don't know. Do numbers go to zillions? But there I stood with these two things, and that was a huge turning point in my life. And then after so many rejections, that book sold. Whew. But that the same power is working for all of us. It puts us, or effectively speaking, we put ourselves through these tests of belief, these tests of character, these tests of experience. And when we pass them, strange things happen. Well, when we don't pass them, that's also another step along the way, too. There's definitely an intelligence guiding things. I, I would agree with that without question. Something is guiding us. Yes. And something that is life-affirming, that is positive, that if we turn to it, whatever name you want to use for it, uh, we're somehow helped along the way. Good things happen, no matter what our situation is. I mean, like the guy lying on the sidewalk, right? Some, uh, an, an opportunity comes. Do we take the opportunity? Do we gamble? Do we say, okay, I'm going to do this crazy thing. I'm going to open this book, even though this, the last thing I want to do is read under this street light. I'm going to read one sentence, and it's going to change my life. Yeah. I think most of us can look back at, at changing uh, important turning points in our lives and see uh, similar things that happen, just odd coincidence. I want to run something by you. Because you have experienced remote viewing and you know that our whole paradigm of time-space is not what we have believed it is, that everything is accessible, everything. When it comes to creative works, a lot of times people say, well, if it's not human, it's not alive. Well, you know for a fact that creative works are alive. They're animate. They have a life oh, of sure. their own. Yeah. But many authors and creative people don't always relate to them as if they're animate. Huh? And that may be why eight years later, the completion of Jonathan became available because it had a life of its own. It wasn't ready for its completion until eight years later. That's, that's very true. And some people have said in, in publishing, they, they have said, the timing of that book, Richard, was perfect. And I didn't tell them, hey, that book started eight years earlier. Would the timing have been perfect eight years earlier? Had it finished the whole thing? I don't have a clue. I really don't know. But timing was very important to Jonathan. There were a lot of other things going on in the world. Um, um, a lot of old uh, paradigms were being broken and Jonathan was kind of talking about that and demonstrating that in a way that individuals could uh, relate to that, say, hey, this is my life, too. Uh, yeah, there, those ideas are living ideas, and they come to us no matter what our calling is. Um, if we're dancers, then maybe some magical choreography comes to our mind. If we're um, actors, there's a part that will suddenly come to us and will sing to us. Or if we're if we're in the advertising business, there'll be oh, fantastic! Here's a really great approach to taking this to, to selling this product. Whatever it is, uh, those ideas come as living things, and it's up to us to decide. I'm going to run with this, or no, nah, this is not for me. And that, that, that's, what, that's what we put ourselves here for, is to express our highest nature. Now, we don't always have to do that, and we can fail miserably if we want to. I believe we live an uh, indefinite series of life experiences, so there's always 
we have a zillion opportunities to fail and uh, an equal number to succeed and see what that feels like. Long term, there is no failure. Uh, Long term, it's not possible to destroy life. It goes on in different forms, always. And us, always. So we're... It's, there's a line in Illusions that says, we're the otters of the universe. <laughs> we're these playful life forms, and we dive into these lifetimes, and we splash around, and we have disasters, and we have huge successes, and all that kind of thing. And beyond it all, we're untouched. We go through living, and we go through dying, and we do it over and over and over again for the fun of it. Does Richard Bach have any worries today? Worries? Concerns. Uh, I think once a person reaches this, well, it may not be true at all, but for me, uh, once I reach the understanding, it made sense to me that we do have this indefinite series of life experiences if we want them, then what can touch you then? What, are you suddenly afraid of dying? You've died 100,000 times before been born 100,000 times before. We live simultaneously in alternate universes in which we may be a life form that stretches across galaxies. I don't know, but I, I know that, or my belief is that it's not possible to die and that doing the best we can, no matter where we are, to express the life that we are in all its quirkiness and its funniness and its uh, madness sometimes. Uh, that's what, what we as a life form call learning. That's what we call entertainment. And there's nothing to be afraid of. And we can play the game of being afraid if we want to. But uh, when you reach the point of understanding that you, we chose this life, and by our, our decisions, we chose every event that's happened to us. Once we accept that responsibility... And there's nothing to be afraid of. We accept, accept the responsibility of dying, too, so-called dying, where we'll put aside this body, this overcoat, and um, express our true self in a little different way for a while. Have you had a fulfilling life so far? Wow, and how, and how. To find these few ideas that uh, have presented themselves to me I've done my very, very best to be true to them and to see a few of them touch other people's lives, mostly for the better. Uh, Yeah, that is fulfilling. RichardBach.com has a book on it, but when you click it at the moment, it doesn't open your site. Is that going to become open to us? No. I had a website at one time, and it it was fun and interesting, but it took a whole lot of time because people were finding it, and they were writing in, and I was writing back, and all kinds of things happening on that website. All of a sudden, I realized my whole life was going to be this website. So I shut it down, and I put there's just that one picture of this kind of a placeholder. And someday, my wife Sabrina says she, she wants to get that going again. She doesn't think it's right that it's just a blank page or page <laughs> with a picture of this ratty book that, that our dog chewed on <laughs> one corner of it, the little Messiah's Handbook. I think it would be a nice receptacle for A, people who have read your books, and B, people who would like others to know about your books. It could be, and, and that would be fun. Um, Without you having to be involved to point, uh, in the But I, I don't want to spend my life doing that. Sure. And, I, and I know, too, that, that readers are led to certain books. I'm, it's sure true in my life. I had some examples I gave in you, but there's many more. And so people are led to my books, too, if they're right for them. If they have something that will touch their lives and maybe change it for the better, they'll be led to find those books. And so I don't have to have a website. Sure. I don't have to do anything. Um, it's just, is it, is it going to be something interesting to do? And Sabrina thinks it might be interesting, and I'll go along with it for uh, just so long as that doesn't subsume everything else that I'm want to do in this life. I still have airplanes to fly. <laughs> Does a writer have to be jealous with their time? No, because the idea, the idea is the jealous one. It takes over. Uh, Sabrina's a writer, too, and we both know that when we're in this mode, when we're communicating with the idea, we're only half there. Uh, and 
so expect monosyllables if you ask a question when she's in her writing mode or when I'm in mine. In the midst of uh, writing something, you, you don't have a whole lot of choice. Your mind is on another level. It's in hypnotizing Maria, my mind was flying across the country with this guy making all these sudden revelations and meeting this person who he thinks is a person. She died two years before they met. He doesn't know that until much later on. Um, that stuff is fascinating. And the fascination is a world of its own. It's kind of a, a magnetic twin star. Beautiful. That's Beautiful. orbiting around your life. And and it says, here I am, and you don't have a whole lot of choice. That's just a magnet, <laughs> have a choice to be attracted to a, a huge block of iron. You know? It's attractive, and things happen. Are you a Mac user? Yes, I'm a Mac user. Yeah, I'm, I got so tired with the PC of all this virus stuff. I did, too. That's why I left, and I went yep. to Mac. <laughs> yep, absolutely. We Isn't it fun? A- it's so fun. I agree with you. I, I just don't like firewalls and all this stuff, and then you have to update it and update it. No. With a Mac, I do nothing, and I haven't had any problems. And are you a Word user? Do you do all your writing in any particular program? Uh, yeah, I use uh, uh, Word for Mac. And now I've got used I used to use Zyrite in the olden days, and that was a great program. Um, and I've very reluctantly shifted over to Word, but now I like it a lot, and that's all I use. That's awesome. And lastly, as we close the show today, are there any wishes that Richard Bach is wishing for? Whoa. <laughs> you are so great. Thank you. Uh, no, I think, I think the universe is already a divinely constructed, if I can use that word. Yes. Uh, it's, it's an arena in which we get to discover how important our own attitude is, how important our own thoughts and choices are that change what seems to be the outside world um, into, into a, a com- completely different place than it would have been had we made other choices. I look at myself and say, what would my life be, be like uh, had I never, by coincidence, learned to fly airplanes? I can't imagine that was 50-some years ago that I learned to fly. I can't, if, if I saw the guy, who, the me, who never learned to fly, if I saw him on the street, I wouldn't recognize him. He would look different from the way I look but just because of the flying that I've done. Uh, his ideas would be different. They wouldn't be informed by the metaphor of flight. Uh, would he be an interesting guy? I don't know. I have no clue who that person would be, but I know the choice that I made way back then, just out of high school, by wild coincidence to wash and polish this airplane. In return, I got one hour of flight instruction, 50 minutes of flight instruction every week. Absolutely changed my life, my future. I became a writer, the whole thing, all because of that. And it's true today. The choices that I make right now, this afternoon, the choice I'm making right now, what I want to do more than anything else in all the world is sit here on this bed, hold this telephone, and talk to Kim. That is gonna. That is not only going to change my life, that has changed my life. Here's my day, here's my time, here's the ideas we've been talking about, here's the recognition that Kim's out there, that she's interested in a lot of the same things I am. Where, where is that going to take me? I don't know. <laughs> look out, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> look out. <laughs> look out, Richard. I'm so delighted to have you on. I hope you will join us again in the future. It was worth the wait to have you on. It's so exciting, and I'm so happy for the listeners to be listening to you. Oh, yeah. I cannot tell you what a contribution you're sharing and the gifts that you're sharing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, learning from, and listening to the best-selling author, Richard Bach, the author of Jonathan Livingston Siegel, A Gift of Wings, The Bridge Across Forever, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, There's No Such Place as Far Away, One, Running from Safety, An Adventure of the Spirit, The Ferret Chronicles, and Hypnotizing Maria. Thank you so much for being with us. What a wonderful time. Thank Thank you you so much. Many blessings, Richard.